Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Original Series, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends and variations using large samples of language data. On behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. Now, Corpus Cast is the show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. And in this series, uh, I've been speaking with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas. Since launching back in January, we're now up to episode nine. Yay! Uh, so you can catch up on the first eight episodes on the Aston Originals YouTube channel um, or on Spotify and uh, other podcast providers. Previous guests uh, include way back in January in our first episode, uh, Professor Paul Baker, followed by uh, Professor Eleanor Semino, both from Lancaster University. And I'm mentioning them because today's episode features another prominent researcher in corpus linguistics, also from Lancaster. So in this episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is a little bit different. We're not looking at uh, corpus linguistics applied to a particular discipline of research, but actually about uh, an initiative to train more and more people in the methods and theories associated with corpus linguistics, an online course that was developed by Lancaster University. My guest is Tony McHenry, Distinguished Professor of English Language and Linguistics at Lancaster University and uh, Changjiang Chair at Xi'an Jiao Tong University in China. Uh, he's published widely on corpus linguistics and is the author of at least 18 books, uh, including Corpus Linguistics Method Theory and Practice with Andrew Hardy and the forthcoming book, Fundamental Principles of Corpus Linguistics with Vatsa Bratina. Uh, Tony is known as the founding director of the ESR ESRC Center for Corpus Approaches to Social Science at Lancaster University and undertakes research using corpus linguistics in a range of areas across theoretical and applied linguistics. He's worked on projects in a wide range of languages, including Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Polish, Portuguese, and Spanish. And he's also known for developing the topic of today's episode, the very successful FutureLearn online course, Corpus Linguistics Method Analysis Interpretation, fondly known as the Corpus MOOC, a massive online open course, which I now believe is in its eighth year. Um, and it's the development of this course that I'll be discussing with Tony today. So I'm very pleased to welcome to Corpus Cast uh, my PhD supervisor, I should also mention, uh, <laughs> Professor Tony McHenry. So hi, Tony. It's great to see you. Thank you for Hello, coming. Hello, Robbie. By. Nice to see you again. It's good to chat. And um, I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation all about how this, uh, this online course came about. But before we get into that, I want to start by asking a little bit about your own uh, connection to corpus linguistics. Okay. First of all, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? Well, I think you put it quite well at the beginning. It's about uh, studying language using large, hopefully well-structured samples of language uh, so that we can say something about language as a whole based on our study of specific collections of language data. I like that. Very concise. Um, how did you get started in corpus linguistics? Well, it was quite a long time ago now. Um, I was working in actually computer science at Liverpool University, and I was working on a project where we were trying to develop expert systems, as they were called nowadays, I suppose you call it AI now, uh, to deal with people who were making benefits claimants, uh, benefits claims. And uh, at the time when you did that type of work, you were really working um, to craft rules for how you'd interact with people or use language. And it was very difficult and very error prone, to be frank. And one day I went into the university bookshop, picked up a book called The Computation Analysis of English, which had been done by Roger Garcia, Jeff Leach, and Jeff Sampson. And I started reading it and I thought, what's this all about? Because it was doing things that weren't normally done. It was using mathematics. It was using samples of data in order to look at language. Lots of things you've been told that you shouldn't do, really. And I read the book, A, I was fascinated, B, I was just stunned by how successful the results that they generated uh, by breaking all the rules, so to speak, were. 
so certainly on my next trip up to Lancaster, I started to attend seminars. I remember I attended a seminar by Jeff on this, and I was really taken by it because um, it actually, if you like, rebutted many of the criticisms of doing this by demonstrating that it really added value if you took this approach. You know, you could make arguments against it, and I've read all the arguments against it, but uh, actually uh, it worked. <laughs> so that's what really got me into it, it really hooked me. And do you think that you were at the time um, sort of relatively easily persuaded? Because my impression is that there was a period where there were people um, advocating for this approach, but there may have been a lot of resistance to this idea of um, treating language as data, so to speak, and, and oh, looking yeah. at large samples like that. Yeah, well, I was reasonably easily persuaded because I'm a great pragmatist. And when I read the book, uh, and then when I tested it a little and talked to people, I could see that for the purposes they were putting the corporate to, they got really good results. It worked. Yes, I understood the philosophical arguments against it, but I've always been quite prepared to trump a philosophical argument with actually practical results. And that's exactly what it was. But that process of the sort of long slog um, trying to persuade people that this was the case uh, it was very difficult. In fact, I remember Roger Garside once told me a story about a paper he gave on the early parts of speech development work at um, an ACL, Association of Computational Linguistics, conference, um, where, of course, most people would be doing what I've been doing at Liverpool University and working with rules and the like. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, somebody came up to him and said, that was a very brave paper to give. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and now, of course, it, it sounds like a nonsensical remark, but, you know, he was really pushing against the grain of thought in that room. Um, and it's hard to imagine that now, but, but for a long period of time, including during my own career, um, it certainly wasn't popular um, or even respectable at times to say you're using corpus data. Mm. So a lot has changed um, because you would, lot, you, would, yeah. you wouldn't see that sort of reaction to a talk like that now, really. No, I don't think you would. Of course, there are still people in the, I suppose, generativist tradition who might put forward some of those arguments. But even so, even there, you do find people using corpus data from time to time. And sometimes it's just based on misapprehension. I remember attending a talk by uh, Macaulay where he said, somebody asked, in fact, I think it was Jeff Sampson asked him why he hadn't used corpus data. And he said there wasn't a corpus big enough for what he wanted to do. And Jeff said, uh, well, what would you need? He said, oh, I'd need a parsed corpus of at least 100,000 words. And Jeff said, well, I've got a million words parsed if you want to use them. <laughs> so sometimes I think it's just misunderstanding. Hmm. Uh, but also just a lack of curiosity to find out what you can discover um, if you take uh, language data as I would say, seriously. So speaking of uh, helping people to understand and satisfying their curiosity, one of the ways, of course, is to shout about it from the rooftops. And yep. uh, what better way in the, the digital age than to put up a free online course that anybody can attend? And that's exactly what you did. I think yep. back in 2014 uh, was was more or less when, when it all came together. So really the the focus today is is the story of of how the the corpus MOOC, the massive uh, open online course came about. But why don't we start then? Tell us what is this course? What, you know who's it for? What does it offer? Um, and what is the the concept behind the the corpus MOOC? Yeah, uh, very difficult questions to answer, of course. They're very short ones with the very difficult questions to answer. But I'll have a try. Uh, when I originally conceived it, the idea was to produce a course that would actually deal with beginners and also appeal to people who were much more expert. So the course has a variety of materials on it. Um, you can take a straightforward course, you can just take all of the, what you would think of as obligatory material, and you get that beginner's course. Um, however, every week also has additional lectures in it. So if you're a more experienced researcher, you can still go to the course and find some value there. So it was conceived of as a sort of broadly based course where a whole range of people could get value from it. Another important thing about the conception of the course was that it was supposed to be as close to the experience of actually going to a university and taking a course as we could possibly get. 
So we wanted lecture-like things. We wanted seminar-like things. We wanted people to have access, free access to readings so that they could do the readings before the seminar, that type of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and also at the same time, we wanted people to have some experience of the sort of social nature of learning at university, you know, overheard conversations that you might have in the JCR, that type of, the mm -hmm. junior common room, that type of thing. So we tried to sort of put together materials which would reflect that sort of broad experience of being at university. Now, of course, it isn't the same. It isn't the same. Mm -hmm. But for people who are too time poor or cash poor, to actually come to Lancaster, we thought we'd give them an experience which is as close to it as we might possibly manage. And I think we did a reasonable job of that. So let's go back to eight or nine years ago when it was coming together. I believe this was pretty much at the same time as you were launching your um, your research center, um, yeah. the Corpus Approaches to Social Science, as I mentioned. Um, yeah. Where did the this was probably one of the earlier um, MOOCs that I remember hearing about. Obviously, it's you know a lot has changed, and that there seems to be a MOOC for, for everything these days. A bit like a podcast, so it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, but at the time, you know, was it was there much persuasion that had to be done to to people around you to make it happen? And and how did you team up with with FutureLearn, which I think is the name of the company that that hosts it. How, how did that come together? Okay. Well, at the time I was on the university's senior management team and we had a Monday morning meeting where the vice chancellor told us that um, the minister looking after the university at the time, I think it was David Willits, had decided that the UK should have some type of online learning facility, future learn had been set up mm. and they were looking for courses to put on and he wondered if Lancaster would do one. And if they did, he wondered how on earth we'd ever persuade somebody to do it. And I instantly thought, what a great idea. And I said, well, I'll do it. Um, and they said, I won't even listen. Yes, yes, yes. And they said, well, we should warn you that it's November now. This is November 2013. And Future Learn launches in January 2014. And they, they want material by then. I said, oh, it's fine. I'll do an eight week course. And um, we set about developing the materials and developing the course from there. So it was something of a wild ride. Um, but it was really just one of those moments when an opportunity comes along and you think, well, I'll seize it. I must say, it was also easy to seize because not many people wanted to seize it. Oh, it's your cat. It's yeah. Pressed, it? <laughs> yes, cat yeah, sorry, but those watching on YouTube, you might see a tail swishing about. Sorry, don't let that distract you as much as it distracts me. <laughs> it distracts me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of all the distracting thing, a cat's tail was the one that was going yeah. to get me. It's yeah, there you go. Anyway. Yeah. And so, yes, people weren't clamoring to do it. In fact, when I announced that I was going to do this, um, there's certainly one colleague in the faculty who said to me, well, it's not serious teaching on a MOOC. Why are you wasting your time on that? It's not serious. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting that one of the things that people outside Lancaster won't see, although maybe they have, and actually maybe this explains some of the things as well, is that once the MOOC could run and people could see what the potential of it was for pedagogy, as I say, especially for people who for one reason or another, can't attend the university. There was actually a rush of people then to put these mm -hmm. MOOCs on. Whereas at the time, I think we were something like Future Learn second course or something like that. It was ridiculous. We, we were very early adult, um, very early within the suite of offerings. Yeah, I, I remember it at, at the time I was <clears throat> studying at Lancaster, and I remember as it was being developed, it did seem to be very much a, a new initiative compared to mm. compared to now. Um, you, yeah. you mentioned, of course, that the the challenge of um, the difference between a face to face university experience, and you're right, it's it's not the same, um, but. Traditionally, if you will, you know, when you learn about corpus linguistics at a university, you might do a lot of seminars where you're sat in a computer yep. lab with 20 or 25 other people and you're all working away on tasks on computers and talking to each other. Yep. How do you 
translate that sort of activity to the online context, particularly when other other classes there is it all I, I assume asynchronous the, or are there live uh, elements as well? No, no live element is purely asynchronous. Yeah, well, partly of course, um, being a Liverpoolian, I'd always do this with a little help from my friends, mm -hmm. and I was very fortunate in that a lot of people contributed to it uh, very generously with their own time. And say, for example, with um, teaching people to use tools, uh, the tool providers themselves provided um, video tutorials. So Lawrence Anthony, who was at Lancaster at the time, very generously uh, sat down and recorded a bunch of them for uh, Antconc. Andrew Hardy did some incredibly detailed ones for CQP web. Mm -hmm. So we were very fortunate in that respect. And the other thing, of course, is to provide as much online support as you possibly can. And again, I was very fortunate, indeed blessed, that the university gave me a budget to hire tutors so that although it was asynchronous, um, we could pretty much guarantee that within a couple of hours, if somebody asked a question in our forums, they would get an answer. That was our goal. A couple of hours, there had to be an, an answer. Now, of course, with a worldwide course, that was rather difficult. So we actually made sure that we had tutors in different time zones <laughs> so that pretty much somebody was always on duty. There's somebody in America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that worked. And actually, people really appreciated the responsiveness. So, yes, it's asynchronous. Yes, that represents a challenge. But saying to somebody, you'll get an answer within a couple of hours, that worked. And mm. also this sort of generous contribution of video content from people who were actually better positioned than I to talk about the software that they had developed uh, was also very helpful. So tell me about these um, the, the, the the tutors you you just mentioned about how you tried to get coverage around the world. Who who yeah. were these people? Not not necessarily specific, but you know, were these other professors at universities, or were they uh, postdocs, PhD students, or just anyone you could mm -hmm. find who would be happy to, to help out? <laughs> um, well. I think initially it was by and large people who just happened to be at or were associated with Lancaster. Um, so they'd done their PhD with us or doing a PhD with us, or they were uh, an RA or research fellow with us, something like that. So we recruited from that pool. But of course, Lawrence contributed as well in the first run in Japan although he's in Britain at the time. But we've had people over the years volunteer to contribute um, you know, from Spain, other such places. Uh, so it's been quite interesting, the sort of range of people who volunteered to contribute. But um, really the key is that at Lancaster, we have a very international postgraduate cohort, and a lot of them are interested in corpus linguistics. So it was actually relatively easy to be able to get good tutors who could cover a range of time zones. Um, so that worked really well. Also, sometimes we, we try to provide support in the user's language as well. So um, that can be quite helpful. So, you know, having people who can uh, speak and write Mandarin on the course, for example, can be helpful so they can provide support in Mandarin because we don't want it to be the case that people just have to have English before they access corpus linguistics. So over the years, we've added more and more uh, subtitles in different languages to enable that to happen. But at the same time, that then builds up the need to make sure that you cover the range of languages for the forum, because they will reasonably ask their question in that language. Mm -hmm. So you have to think like that, Robbie, when you're putting these teams together. But as I say, at Lancaster, that wasn't such an issue mm -hmm. uh, because of the nature of the postgraduate and also uh, research cohort that we have. And, and what a great training opportunity for for them as well, uh, particularly these these junior colleagues who um, are still doing a PhD or have recently graduated and yeah. are getting experience, particularly at online teaching. At, at the time, it probably didn't feel like, you know, this would be the future quite as much as it has become now. <laughs> yes, I, I'd like to say I was a great visionary and that I could see it all coming, um, but that probably isn't true. One thing that really helped us with the MOOC, incidentally, is that for a time in the early 2000s at Lancaster, we did do similar things, but on the intranet. I, don't, I think we'd probably stopped it by the time you did your undergraduate mm. degree. But sort of the early first five years of the 2000s, 
uh, we actually used to put together MOOC-like courses that were just taken internally. They were usually focused on the technical aspects mm -hmm. of linguistics, so to speak, phonetics, uh, grammar, uh, and were largely designed to give students the opportunity to go back and, and study afresh subjects that they found relatively challenging and also to get practice at things. So we'd had some experience in-house of doing this. So that was probably more visionary than what happened in 2013, because in 2013, we were sort of reacting to an opportunity, whereas in the early 2000s, we were making the weather more to speak. So you, you, you said you sort of almost so, quite casually, so said, oh, I'll do an eight week course, fine. Yes. But then you had to do it and design it and decide what goes in and crucially what doesn't go in, because there's so much more that could go in that you can't yeah. possibly cover in eight weeks. How did you actually go about designing this course? How did you prioritize what yeah. to include and what to, to leave out? Yeah, well, first of all, thinking of the overall design of the course was very important before you even got to the content. Now that might sound like a, a slightly strange comment because I'm not even talking about the curriculum. Oh. What I'm talking about are some of the known properties of MOOCs. Mm. So up front, somebody said, well, you know, with MOOCs, you lose something like 50% of the students each week. So what are you going to do about that? Well, I'm quite a humble person. And my view is I can't imagine why it would be very much different for me, mm. certainly in the first instance. So I'll work with it. I'll actually try and design the course around this. So, for example, the overall structure of the course goes a bit like this. The first week is designed as a sort of one bite take on corpus mm -hmm. linguistics. So the people who only take the first week will actually get an idea of the subject. And if they never come back, which is half of them, they'll actually leave with something useful in their heads. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, my humility only, only goes so far, I decided I was going to try and book the trend and actually keep more than 50% of the students, but that I'd have two speeds in the course, so to speak. We'd run through to week four, and after week four, I was going to have a cliff edge and make things more difficult and take the more committed students through to the end. So my vision for it is you'd have something that sort of went like that, and then like that, yeah? Okay. So there'd be sort of two cliff edges in after week one and then after week four. So that very high level planning decision then dictated to some extent the ordering of materials within the course itself. I also knew that there were probably, knew probably, that's great. I also knew there were probably topics that students were much more interested in. So I used those as bait towards the end of the course for them to stay with us, so I motivated that. So lots of thinking like that went into trying to book that trend after week one. I knew in week one you couldn't do so much in a week that would really grab them that they'd stay in bigger numbers than usual. But after that you could. Then actually in terms of content it was easy. We, we teach corpus linguistics in a couple of ways, undergraduate, postgraduate. We had summer schools, we could draw on some of the materials for that. So we had lots of sort of structured materials that we could use as inspiration uh, for developing the curriculum. So that part was really easy. And then, as I've said, for things like the seminars and tutorials, people chipped in and that was really a great help. So we're back in 2013, 2014. You've had the idea. You've worked together with FutureLearn. You've designed the program, made all the materials, recorded all these videos and everything, yeah, got all these yeah. readings together. Now you need to actually recruit <laughs> students. <laughs> How did you go about, you know, telling people about it and, and encouraging people to apply, particularly yeah. with the vision of it being a worldwide, you know, freely accessible endeavor? Yeah, that's an interesting one because certainly the orthodox thinking at the time was future learn would help with this. Mm. And future learn, of course, are very helpful. Let me emphasize that. But I thought, well, I'm skeptical at this point about that claim for two reasons. One, they're a startup. I think they're still sort of establishing the comms operation. So I had doubts about how easily they would reach out. Also, just in talking to the future learn people, um, I sense that the 
their heart or interests lay elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't so familiar with what we were doing. It took some explaining to get through to them. So I thought the likelihood of them being able to reach out to the community that we want to access is probably quite low. So what we did is we used our own social media feed because we realized that because people like myself, Václav, etc., have social media feeds which are actually quite tightly focused in terms of content. You know, I talk about corpus linguistics and linguistics related things and very little else. Mm. We realized it was a good channel of communication, so we used that. And indeed, later on with some of the surveys that we did of people who took the first course, uh, we realized that we had recruited by the by uh, quite well through social media as opposed to people just building up to the future learn website and if i had more data i would have suspected that the dropouts would have been ones recruited through the future learn website and mm -hmm. the people who persisted were ours mm -hmm. but that's a guess so uh, <laughs> social media was very very helpful because of the nature of the social media channels that we had access to so tell me about that the reception to the first run of the course how did it mm -hmm. how did it go what did people think of it <laughs> Um, well, I think FutureLearn were amazed because it was incredibly popular and also it was their most international MOOC. You know, I think they thought that there were topics which were just more likely to get the numbers and which were more likely to excite people internationally. Whereas my thinking was that if you or the place you work are very well known for something, and you manage to get the message out to the right audience that you're doing something like this, it would be very popular. And it, mm. well, I think I was proved to be right. So I think for the first run, I think we got something like 20,000 registrations for the course and about 10 and a half thousand people actually showed up in week one. Wow. So uh, into the heads of 10 and a half thousand people, I managed to pour that important nugget in week one, which is the sort of idea of corpus linguistics in a nutshell. And that was quite helpful. But it was quite exciting, I've got to admit, uh, at the time, uh, I was sort of calling people like Lawrence Anthony or Andrew, possibly even you through to my office saying, look, the numbers are going yeah. up. And, you know, this started around 3000 and then just became increasingly exciting as it went higher than that. So, yeah, it was pretty exciting. And indeed, it went so well that FutureLearn got us to remount that course again that year. That was a year when it ran twice. Uh. And we got slightly fewer numbers second time, but still a very large number uh, for that second run, which I think happened in the November, October, November, something mm. like that. Because I always thought that January wasn't a great start time, especially because the course, from the point of view of university teaching, the course is very much designed as a first term course in the sense that you'd want to be building on it in terms two and three rather than slipping it in the middle where it was unlikely to be very comfortable so i was really pleased to do it twice in one year because it managed to bump me onto that sort of um, autumn or fall as the americans would say track uh, which is where the course has stayed ever since and it's exactly where it's designed for so it ran twice in the first year and then since then it started every September, every yeah, year. Yeah, annually. It starts again September this year. Thank you for that opportunity to say this. <laughs> oh, don't worry. That There's more of that for later on. <laughs> Plenty of chance to plug it. That's fine. <laughs> um, I think one one of the, the, the really fun features of the course that I remember you doing at, at the time um, was you conducted a series of, of sit-down interviews with oh, yes. academics uh, in the field from all over the place, not not so dissimilar to the sort of thing that, that we're doing now, although I think at the time you did them actually face to face. Yeah, um, yes, I did. It was a good opportunity you, for socialization apart from the encounters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they look, you know, the people that you spoke to, I'm sure you had a great time. Um, do you have any sort of particular memories of, of individuals who you, you got the chance to speak with? Any fun stories or, or yeah. you know, how was that period? Because you must have done them all within quite a, a short period of time. Quite intensely. I, I did. I added a few in the couple of years that followed, but most of them were actually done in that first 12 months or so. Mm. Of course, it was a very, it, for people who know me well, you do, you'll know this is uh, true. It was a rather a homespun affair. I had a, a home video camera yeah. and a tripod, and I used to 
wander around with that in the Sainsbury's bag. And then when we were ready, I'd sort of set it up. No special microphones yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. Just set it up. Sometimes it would go in and out of focus, but nobody seemed to notice. And before mm. I tell any stories, I'll, I'll say that's a really important point. Nobody noticed the sort of amateurish production of that because the content was great. Mm. And it was interesting after the first run of the MOOC, uh, there's a survey that's sent to the students and uh, they were asked about the production values and got really high scores for production values. And actually, I put no effort really into doing anything glamorous. In fact, I was against it. I wanted it to be just like a university, talking head lectures, etc., mm. and sort of uh, slightly ropey video work. Um, and because of the nature of the content, the students thought the quality of the production was very high. But in fact, it clearly wasn't, you know, in, in technical terms. Yeah. Anyway, so it was a bit of a homespun affair. In terms of memorable stories from it, well, there were all sorts of things. I think Mike Scott stopped off on his motorbike at the university in his leathers, and he had to change out of those before we had the chat, and then he got back on his motorbike and whisked off down the M6. That was quite a good one. Um, the conversation with Jeff... Leach was a very long one because we'd known one another for a very long time by that point. And, and that conversation slid off into a general chat. So mm. if people watch that, it's split in two on the course because it went on for so long. Um, that really was probably the most naturalistic one I did, largely because Jeff just forgot the camera was there. In fact, there's a slight edit in one of them because Jeff rushes off screen to get his notebook, because he used to carry a little notebook with him, mm -hmm. uh, in which he jotted interesting examples of language use as he went around, and he wanted to find this notebook, and it was in his jacket across the way. So he just went off screen and thought, oh, we're filming. But I won't tell him, because it would break yeah. the moment, you know, the magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was very Jeff. He just forgot, you know, he was focused mm -hmm. on language, so everything else was forgotten. And he mm -hmm. sort of went off screen and got that. Interestingly, also, it might sound counterintuitive, but there's some very happy memories I have of doing the interview with uh, Adam Kilgariff, mm. who was dying at the time he had cancer. Mm. And when I'd written to him, he, I thought he'd just say no. Mm. Um, but he said, yes, as long as you can come to my house. So I went down to Brighton, um, which was pleasant enough in itself, found Adam's house, had a great time chatting to him. Um, he was ill, you know, it was obvious he was not very well. Uh, but we had a really nice time and it was nice to connect with him one more time. Mm. Or rather, two more times, because halfway through that interview, unbeknownst to me, the battery on my home camera ran out. <laughs> oh no. So when I got back to the hotel and discovered this, I had to write back and say, thanks Adam, that was great. But is it possible I could come again tomorrow and we could do the last half? And he was very game about it. He said, yes. We both dressed in the same clothes. <laughs> Brilliant. He, he, uh, his wife had made me a cup of tea. So we got the tea in the same cup. And I drank half of it and put it down in front of me before it began. But the whole thing was nearly ruined on the way there, because on the way to his house, I don't know, it was a sort of sixth sense. I looked up and I saw this seagull above me and I dodged out the way because it dropped this <laughs> little message almost right on top of me. And it just missed my jacket. And I thought, oh, thank heavens it missed the jacket, because that would have been a definite giveaway. <laughs> or shirt. I think it was a shirt. Anyway. So, wow. yeah, the, the, the interview with Adam actually was huge fun. It was just nice anyway as a sort of end mm. piece, you know, um, well, knowing one another. Mm. Um, but it also it's just full of entertaining incidents like that. And there is actually, again, a tiny edit, but this time I think we did it in two parts or something like mm. that to, to hide it away. Um, but, yeah, he was wonderful. And it was a really good interview. I thought that mm. was more. I'm sure who, there are plenty of other stories too. I can't remember them. Who knew the Lancaster University continuity department was so uh, <laughs> was so well invested to get every detail, making sure it looked the same? It was brilliant. <laughs> well, probably people can watch that video and, and spot the differences yeah. between the first half and the second. <laughs> but that's that's really nice, though. That you know, because 
sadly, some of the people that you interviewed uh, have passed away since you yes. conducted those interviews. It, it's preserving their legacy as well by, by making these videos available. It is, and I always find it nice to hear them speak about what they did, mm. uh, especially Jeff, things like that, Adam. Um, but maybe especially Jeff, because the sort of experience goes back so far. Um, I view that video as particularly precious in the sense mm. that it sort of preserves his voice and his view um, on what he did, and what he did was wonderful. Well, I'm sure people appreciate the chance to to be able to watch these uh, these interviews. If you did, did you say you've done more since then, or or is it basically just this this initial kind of core set that you did at the time? Well, Vatslav's taken over doing those now, mm. uh, and actually there are a couple for next year, though. Well, for this year, next month that's coming mm. up. Maybe I should save that until we talk about what's new. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's fine. That sounds good. Um, another thing that I, I I certainly know that you remarked at the time that you enjoyed um, was the chance to interact directly with the students in the oh, yeah. discussion boards and and the mm. chat functions and and that sort of stuff and i know you you really enjoy that um yeah. what is you know what is it about this sort of interaction that you that you enjoy and do you find that you're learning from them as much as they're learning from you that's absolutely the case uh, the thing i really enjoy about it is hearing about what they're doing uh, oftentimes it interests me and sometimes you know they're working with languages i haven't studied um or know anything about or possibly haven't even heard of <laughs> um, and you get the opportunity on the um, bulletin board or the the exchange board to actually ask them questions about that get them to talk about their research and express interest and enthusiasm in that ask them to write to you and tell you what's going on and some of them do when they finish the papers they send it along to you but also then you get the opportunity sometimes to turn your uh, seminar task so to speak into sort of a little quasi research uh, events. So I think usually for the week where we look at attitudes to refugees and migrants in the press, we get people to go out and look at a local paper in their own language, and then come back and report on a range of languages, a range of contexts on what the representation of refugees and migrants is. So you can actually use the students as a resource at that point. Mm -hmm. Not a formal one, you'd never publish it, but it can sort of inform your own understanding of particular topics because you have an incredibly wide variety of L1 backgrounds on the course. And if you can use that as a sort of teaching resource, wonderful. So I, I love it. <laughs> Well, that's great. That's that's good. And and you know, students this year will will look forward to the the chance to interact with with you and and the others involved. Let's uh, let's let's move on to to the present day now with with the MOOC. It's been running um, since twenty fourteen. Um, the the latest iteration launches on the nineteenth of September. So I'm reliably informed. Um, what are you What are you excited about this year? And and I guess what has changed over the mm. last eight years how has the course developed and 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 yeah. how does it look now compared to how it did when it began yeah well oh a good few years ago now maybe six years ago something like that i asked Vatslav to start that's Brezina to start to get involved in the course and to make some decisions about its direction now initially i suspect Vatslav thought that he should cherish this uh wonderful gift and leave it untouched but i encouraged him to continuously revise and update the curriculum early on we did a little bit of that but it was usually in the uh, form of adding on the expert lectures that we had each week we'd add some more on but i said you know as time goes on it's a fast moving subject you should sort of reform it change it change some of the topics bring in more faces the only reason that i did all the lectures in the first run or two is I couldn't really impose on anybody else to do that many lectures in such a short period of time. Mm. So uh, there was nothing holy about the content, you know, it really needed to be refreshed and updated if it was to remain contemporary and relevant. So over time, uh, different lectures have been given by different people, so it's not me all the time, which is a great thing. Um, and also some new topics have been introduced or new takes on topics have been introduced. And also, of course, uh, Václav has in developed and now introduces Lanxbox on the course as well, which is a great 
uh, resource for students to use, as well as other things. You know, they can still use uh, AntConf, which is a great program. They can still use CQP Web, which is especially useful for certain activities. So that's changed as well. So a lot has changed. Uh, this year, I suppose, two changes, one from sentiment, one from interest, uh, interest me greatly. Firstly, the um, promotional video has changed, and it's now done by Václav rather than me. Um, I did the original promotional video, which is the only time I think I've ever worked with a green screen. Um, it wasn't the promotional video I wanted. The promotional video I wanted um, which was eccentric and I was put off it, um, was I would be in the library talking about the difficulty of analysing very large numbers of words. And I had this vision that students would actually just walk past me casually and start to deposit books around me. Ah. Until a bit like um, Winnie in Beckett's Happy Days. She's up to the neck in sand at the end of the play. I'd be up to the neck in books. And the clever idea was they were actually going to be placing them on two wheelie trolleys which would be out of shot so then i'm going to mention corporate they wheel these books out the way and that step forward. Uh, i wish i'd done that video uh, i really do are you are you telling me i could have been in that video you i could have been, been putting depositing books on books a trolley and, oh, that's a great idea that's a great idea oh that's such a shame stolen from beckett but there we are but instead we did the green screen thing because the university thought that would be better and I so that's right I do hope that that video is still available, the, the original one. Uh, oh, you... it, it was never shot. They wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> they did let <laughs> me go into the university. I went into the stacks, um, sort of behind the shop at the university where they have books sort of that could have been used in that way and trolleys. Uh, but they, they quickly stopped the idea, I think. That, I don't know, the brand values or something. That was mm -hmm. right. Anyway, so Vatslav's done uh, something equally good. And of course, uh, Vatslav's much keener on production values than I was, so his videos much slicker. His videos are <laughs> his slides are always slicker than mine, etc. Mm. So that that's good that there's the new intro. Um, but also this year there's a new interview actually with somebody you'll remember called Ruth Avon, mm. and Ruth's job for us for some years now has been doing spoken transcriptions or orthographic transcriptions, and you know. As a job, that's painstaking and requires a great deal of attention to be paid to detail. So, although it's not the most glamorous of topics, perhaps, it is one of those topics where it's essential to understand it, get it right, do it well. Um, and the talk is all about that and her experiences of doing things like transcribing the Trinity Lancaster Corpus, for example. So I think uh, that conversation with Ruth, I think, is probably the highlight of new material for me uh, in the course this year. Oh, well, I look forward to uh, to signing up and 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 having a look at that because uh, I remember Ruth well, and and she's yeah. wonderful and yeah. uh, a great asset for you. Well, if team. you do sign up, actually, yeah. Everything you said about Ruth is right, and you'll get to see her. But also, it probably isn't your first time of signing up. And in that respect, actually, the refreshing of the course also um, shows another advantage in that we have students who come back year after year and take the course again, partly because the volume of material, the optional material we produce is too large for one year, so they come back and consume it again, but also because of the refreshing of the curriculum, people come back and take it again. Some of them are like old friends. I think they've taken it four or five times. I said, wow. oh, you're back. <laughs> Well, that's the the great thing about it being free and 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 widely accessible. Um, I do know that FutureLearn has you know paid tiers where you can get more access, but it is still free at the point point of access, as far as Absolutely. I understand. Yeah. So and you the, have people coming back. Oh yeah, and I've maintained my distinct lack of interest in charging people for it. Yes, FutureLearn do. I understand why they do. That's their business. But uh, we've always made it very clear that the materials themselves to somebody from, I don't know, Afghanistan, Iraq, wherever, uh, should remain free at the point that they connect with them. You know, additional things that they may want, they may have to pay for, like certificates, etc. But the content that we provide to them is free. So now it's been running for several years. Uh, do you have any sense of the, I, I hesitate to use this word, 
impact um, because I know it's quite a loaded word in higher education generally. Yeah. Um, but do you, sort of lowercase uh, i impact. Um, do you have a sense of you know the effects that that the course has had? Are there people who took the course to have now gone on and and you know become researchers and 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 academics themselves? Or what is yeah. the sense of the scale of the effect that? that the course yeah. has had? Well, the scale, of course, can be measured in a range of ways. Um, we wanted a course that was primarily oriented towards the postgraduate market. And every course that's run, when we've done the survey at the end, we found that we have principally postgraduates on the course. So you know, we get what we want. So its, it's impact has probably been greatest at the postgraduate level as a consequence. Another way of thinking about the impact is in terms of geographical spread. And that was very important to me um, because I wasn't desperately interested in the idea of letting people know about corpus linguistics who could find out about it very easily anyway, or who could attend a local university and find out about it easily anyway. The idea was to, I think I've used the expression before, reach out to the um, time poor or the cash poor, and make sure that those people also have the opportunity to find out about this. So every year we have students taking the course from countries where they wouldn't be granted a visa to visit mm -hmm. the UK in all likelihood. And that's very important to me. And also from a range of countries where the um, income levels are such that it's unlikely that they get the opportunity to come even if they could get a visa. So that type of impact is very, very important to me. Beyond that, yes is the answer to your question about academic impact, in that there are many, many examples of people who change their PhD topic slightly to incorporate corpus linguistics, both within linguistics and beyond. Um, some of them go on to get um, lectureships um, or fellowships. Uh, there was certainly one Canadian researcher who was with us uh, as a fellow funded by the Canadian Research Council, the SSHRC, um, during the pandemic actually, which was unfortunate, so she didn't really get the chance to come to Lancaster for very long. But um, she took the MOOC, it changed the direction of her PhD, which was in education, and then she really went on and did that type of work and has actually just recently published a paper on her corpus linguistics take on a question in education research. So we find a lot of that. And in terms of personal impact, when one gets the opportunity to travel abroad nowadays, I, I inevitably end up having uh, my photo taken with a group of people who ask me if uh, <laughs> I am the man from the MOOC. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm always touched by their gratitude. Um, I never did it for gratitude from anybody, um, but I'm always touched by their gratitude. And if they want to photograph with me, well, if the lens on the camera is strong enough, they're quite welcome. But honestly, Robbie, I don't think I've been anywhere uh, in terms of academic conferences um, or universities uh, since the MOOC started where somebody hasn't said, oh, I took your MOOC, or oh, I saw you on the MOOC, etc. And um, that's, well, I suppose I'll be honest, that's hugely satisfying. Mm. You know, the, the effort was worth it for me and everybody else involved. So as we start to, to wrap things up here, um, I suppose... <laughs> nice way of saying shut up. <laughs> 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 no, no. I was actually in my head, I was laughing because you said the man from the MOOC and I was thinking of, you know, the REM song, Man on the Moon, the man on the oh, moon. The moon yes. um, yeah. um, what do you see for the future? Is this it now every every year and until the day you retire or, or right. how, what do you what do you see happening for the MOOC as, as time goes on? Well, um, the future past, first of all, um, as I say, one of the really positive things that the MOOC did was change the attitude of a lot of colleagues towards such education and consider the impacts that we've just talked about and consider the impacts that they can have with their subject. And we're seeing many more MOOCs now. Um, and I think that's a good thing, you know, people reaching out, talking about their disciplines. If I was to do it again today, and maybe this will give a sort of idea of future travel direction. Um, 
maybe I'd do it differently. Um, I could certainly conceive of doing a sort of TikTok course um, because one of the things that was mentioned to me early on in the MOOC is that I should chop up lectures, etc., and content into uh, bite-sized chunks. Mm. I was initially dubious about that, though I did it. But it was very interesting when we got some of the early surveys back and a lot of people were as they may be doing for your podcast, listening to it on the bus, on a smartphone, that type of thing, or watching video on a smartphone. Mm. So I, I really got at that point why bite-sized chunks were the way to go. Um, and, you know, with something like TikTok, you could imagine doing sort of two-minute videos on corpus linguistics um, or any other topic for that matter. So it's definitely doable. Um, so I might sort of you know, change the mode in which I did it and may not even work with a partner like FutureLearn, just go ahead and do it. I'm not going to, by the way, so if you want to go ahead and do it yourself, please feel free. But you know, as these sort of um, media platforms change and the possibilities associated with them change, um, so does the um, pedagogical opportunity. So that would be something I'd consider. For me personally, I think that the MOOC as it stands will continue to run because it has a very steady enrollment rate. Mm. In the early days, certainly when we got the big numbers, um, the question arose as to whether there was a large pool of unsatisfied demand mm. and two or three runs of the course would drain it, that there was no fresh input to it. So it's a bit like taking water out of an aquifer. You know, yes, you can get the water out, but it really doesn't go back in fast enough. So one day you'll hit the dry rock and that's mm. it. But no, this is more like something where well, initially there was a large pool and there's actually a, a fair refresh of that pool each year. So you know, I don't think I'm telling state secrets to say that we pretty much regularly get 5,000 registrations a year for the course still. Mm. And this is many years later. Mm. So, yes, there was that initial large pool, shrank down, but seems to be that the sort of supply feed to it is about 5,000 people a year. So, so that's good. So I think the future is pretty secure for the MOOC. In terms of online education that I'm out doing myself, as I said, I won't do the TikTok thing, though it's deeply tempting because I can see the possibilities of it. Um, and I think I'll probably call it a day on doing uh, online innovations of that sort. But who knows? Maybe there'll be another meeting where somebody says, does somebody want to do this? Mm. And nobody else puts their hand up. And in a rash and impulsive moment, I say, I'll do it. <laughs> and then I go ahead and do it, something like that. So it might happen. You know, the MOOC itself wasn't planned, so maybe my mm. future uh, activities in this area won't be planned. Well, I'll, I'll keep an eye on uh, TikTok and Snapchat and uh, see where you may pop up. <laughs> it's very interesting. The bite-sized piece is very interesting, of course, mm. and it's challenging for academics because it's not our habits are so just people we don't tend to do the bite-sized pieces mm. so you then have to think to yourself how you do decompose things into bite-sized pieces and can they be meaningful and these are really interesting things to think of as an educator um, especially when you realize that more and more people will be coming through to university who are used to this scale of information delivery okay now it's time uh -huh. for our quick questions. Oh, right. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> the same questions I ask each guest at the end of oh, each right. episode. It sounds um, dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Um, what are the biggest changes that you've noticed in corpus research throughout your career? Um, the increasing dominance of the quantitative, I suppose, so the uh, turn towards stats and the turn away from, turn away from, but the lack of emphasis on linguistic description annotation. Brilliant. Question two, um, what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered? Oh, that one's easy. Uh, somebody admitted to me at the research councils once that the first time they heard about it, they thought we were studying dead bodies because they'd heard <laughs> corpse linguistics. Uh, so that's definitely the biggest misconception ever. 
Uh, there's nothing to say about dead bodies with corpus day, pretty much, apart from representation, perhaps. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and finally, um, this may not be so quick, uh, but how will corpus linguistics uh, make an impact on the world in the future, beyond what it already has done? Beyond what it already has done, and what it has done, of course, is substantial. But let me set that to one side and give you a wish, mm. something I wish would happen. Mm -hmm. I wish that people would get a better sense of how they can use corpus linguistics, call it whatever you want, I'll call it corpus linguistics, um, in order to better understand and debunk uh, misleading arguments, misleading statements, statements which are harmful to them, they're prone to believe, all of these things. So in other words, if corpus linguistics can play a role in raising critical awareness within democratic societies, I for one would be delighted. Um, people have tried it in their work, of course, myself included, but um, I think Norman Furcliffe, maybe at the end of Language and Power, talks about the possible emancipatory effects of the work he was doing, which I thought were unlikely to materialize because of the technical nature of what he was doing. But I do believe that corpus linguistics might give people the opportunity just to check some arguments, check ways in which they're being persuaded, etc. Mm -hmm. And it might be possible that you'd get a better informed electorate and population, at least in part, if some people did that. I like that. I like that as a wish for the future. Um, we're going to wrap things up now. Um, thank you very much, Tony. This has been really interesting to hear the story all about the Corpus MOOC, how it was conceived and um, and developed and, and how it's grown over time. And, and it's, uh, it's such a, a great initiative and, as you said, ever popular. And it's running again this year, as we mentioned. It's yep. launching on the 19th of September, um, and it can be found by just going to the Future Learn website and looking for Corpus Linguistics Method Analysis Interpretation. And Tony and also Vatslav's uh, smiling faces will be uh, ready to, to welcome you there. Um, so that's it for this episode of Corpus Cast. Thank you, our uh, listeners and viewers, for joining us, however you've accessed us, whether that's on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, or even Podchaser. Um, do let us know your thoughts about this and all the other episodes. We're up to nine now, as I said, uh, using the hashtag CorpusCast. And make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. CorpusCast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. So thank you again for tuning in. And thank you, Professor Tony McHenry of Lancaster University, for this really interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you. <laughs>